see you as you get settled in. It's always great to see you on this first Sunday in March. I read into one of our older members the other day, and they said they had entered into the snapdragon part of life. I said, snapdragon? They said, yeah, something snapped in their body, and the rest of them, the rest of them is dragon, they said. <laughs> Maybe you there, I hope this will build you up today and encourage you. <laughs> My wife told me the other day, she said, you know what make house cleaning so much more fun? I said, what? She said, a maid? <laughs> A nice try. <laughs> I was in one of my favorite tool stores. I won't name where it was, but my favorite tool place. But I saw a sign there as I was checking out. I thought it was the greatest sign. It said, for an additional $4.95, we will print a receipt which matches what you told your wife you paid for this tool. <laughs> Well, we are still emphasizing and we will continue through this year, the year of evangelism. And we this week we'll be finishing up our Share Jesus Without Fear. I've heard so many good compliments about the class, how much it's encouraged folks and helped them and trained them. It's not too late to be a part of this, even though this is our last session, because we provide you with all of the previous sessions. So if you would like to be a part and join us on Thursday night at 7 p.m., the information is there in the bulletin for you and I would encourage you to join us uh, like I said but the, but the classes are every bit of the class is available if you'll let us know send us a uh, call the office and give us your email we'll email you all the previous sessions and so you'll see a video of the previous sessions and it is easy way to share your faith well next Sunday is a great day in the life of our church a day we've been looking on looking for for a long time next Sunday March the 14th will be a celebration and we're gonna have a great celebration we're gonna have great food I, I'm telling you folks I think it's the pastor said it was 10 I think it's about 14 main food items that we will have we're gonna be right out here in the parking lot right outside of the building now let me just say this we need you to park those of you who have been parking in the back we need some of you to park across the street some of you park over here need to park across the street we need to open up the bill of uh, some of these parking places for some of our uh, older folks and handicapped folks so if you could park across the street and we're going to be shuttling people and helping you that would be great there is some parking down the street too that if you can up to walking you could park a little bit uh, down a ways there but uh, but I hope you'll come and be here it's going to be a great day next Sunday now the following Sunday March the 21st we have a special guest and I want you to hear this little uh, video clip from our special guest that will be here the 21st. Hi, Hi. Matt, Dora. I'm Katie. And I'm Daylin. And we are the Photo Sisters. So looking forward mm -hmm. to being with you all very, very soon. And just to worship our Lord alongside mm -hmm. each one of you and to share a couple of our favorite songs, ones that have brought us through this past year. Mm -hmm. And I hope will just lift up your hearts mm -hmm. as well. Yes. So with that, See you very soon. We can't wait. Bye. If you didn't catch that, that's the Photo Sisters. That's F-O-T-O -O Sisters. And they're going to be at a conference this week uh, for the whole week. And so they're uh, available to be with us, uh, the, or not this week, but the following week when they, they're for the conference. And then on the 21st, they will be with us. They have a real unique music sound. Uh, they have uh, uh, stringed instruments they play and you will really love them so we want you to be aware of that coming on that day ladies you see there the information there about Shonda Pierce coming and there's just a few tickets left if you want a ticket you need to go by uh, the Welcome Center today because today will be your they'll be gone after the day so we just want to make you aware of that and uh, our men's ministry you have a note there in the bulletin about your ministry wants you to know that now the the good news about next week is all the food we're gonna have the bad news is it's time change Sunday next week. That means we lose an hour, okay? We lose an hour. Now, I would suggest trying that on Saturday. Change your clocks on Saturday. I know some of the digital clocks, they won't allow you to, but just try to start thinking about your time Saturday instead of Sunday, and that would be a great thing for you to do. So I uh, uh, just want you to know that next Sunday, you'll have to be here an hour early. You come regular time next week, especially for the food you, you'll be late so 
you be sure you set your time for that for next week all right well we if you're visiting with us today you're our special guest and if you'll look in the pew in front of you there's a card there like this and we'd like to ask you to fill that out and drop that in the offering plate later in the service we would love to have a record of your visit with us and there is Louise Elliott back there God bless you Miss Louise she moved off to North Alabama and she about froze to death so she came down here for some warmth <laughs> so good to see you Miss Louise y'all tell her how glad you are to see her today well it is good to see each of you today let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our service today Father Lord we just praise you and worship you and we commit this service to you that the name of Christ is lifted up and in his precious name we pray amen well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you are here this morning. You know, our time of worship, as I always say, is a time where when we walk in the doors, we put aside those things, those things that are on our mind, those worries that the old world has brought with us, and we focus our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I would challenge you as the week goes by that Sunday is not the only day that you should worship. I would challenge you that worship should be an experience that you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So let's stand together and start this off right by worshiping our Lord. Come thou fount of every blessing.
Jesus, that is our prayer, that you would receive all honor and glory and splendor and power, for you alone are King of kings. You are lo alone are the great physician. Lord, only you can knit two cells back together again. You are the only one, Lord, who can save. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Lord Jesus, you're the only one who saves. You're the only one who can forgive us of all of our sins. You're the only one that can cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You're the only one that can create clean hearts in us. You're the only one, Father, that can heal. And Lord Jesus, we know you're coming again. And we praise your holy name. So today, you receive all honor and glory and splendor and power and majesty be unto you and to you alone. Lord, you're the God who hears. You're the God who answers prayer. And you're, you alone are the one who does that, Lord Jesus. So meet with us now, and may everything that we do be as a sweet-smelling incense before your heavenly throne. May everything that we do honor and glorify you and bring you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you so much, choir. Sure to appreciate your ministry week after week. Aren't we blessed, church? We are so blessed. Well, welcome home, everyone. It's so good to see all of you. And Miss Louise, it's so good to have you back from Alabama. She came from the land of the frozen back home. And so we are so glad that you're here. Uh, if you didn't know, 
uh, Miss Louise was a member here for many years and then moved to be closer to the rest of her family, and we're just glad that she's, she's back with us this morning. Well, each week you hear me say we're touching the world from Mount Dora, and all the time the Lord gives us opportunity after opportunity, and that's true of this week as well. You know that we place a very high value on children here at First Mount Dora. Those are children both after they're born and before they're born. And this week, we held a dinner for all of our children's volunteers, and we had about 30 over in the FMC, and Scott Humpston led that just to our family pastor, just to tell them thank you. And yesterday, we had over 40 of our members in the Walk for Life with Life's Choices, our local pregnancy center. I'm not sure if we were the largest giver, but it wouldn't surprise me if we were. Last year, we were the largest giver, and this year they've raised over $66,000 yesterday for the Walk for Life. And that's right, you can clap for that. Um, and you know that Marla Grimm works for them, but what you may not know, and our, our family pastor, Scott, his wife, Debbie Humpston, is also being trained by Marla. She's a nurse, and she will also go to work there. And also, our youth pastor's wife, uh, Julie Douglas, is also volunteering for them. So if you've ever wanted to volunteer at Life's Choices, you just see one of these ladies, and they'll get you in contact with the right people. At the same time as the Walk for Life, I had a wonderful privilege of opening up in prayer at the uh, Babe Ruth Little League, and it was a great experience. As some of our own children play in that league, Pablo and Miguel, okay, they're there. There's 19 teams. You can go ahead and show the picture, and I thought it was very important that we, that's our team that we sponsor. Uh, church, and so we're sponsoring a little league team so that people know that we value children here. And I think there's a picture of me praying as well on the ball field. There were 260 children there yesterday, and that means it was way more parents and grandparents and then brothers that were older and younger, and you can imagine how many lost families there, there were there yesterday. And uh, so what an incredible opportunity right here. We have now also sponsored that little league so that every ball field on the fence has a huge First Baptist Mount Dora poster on it so that they know that we're in the community. Um, now, last week, you remember that we had over 50 volunteers that packed 15,000 meals for our local food pantry in conjunction with the Florida Baptist Children's Homes. And then we gave that uh, food to Lake Cares this week. They came on Monday to get it to distribute here in our community. Kim Varnador from our local State Farm office paid for all of that food. And that's just a wonderful testimony of a local business owner wanting to make a difference. I wanted you to see this brief video of how we're touching the world right here, one meal at a time.
want to thank Scott Humston, who also leads our social ministry, uh, social media, not social ministry, social media, and he put that video together. I think it's important that you see some of what we're doing each and every week, and I'll, I'll tell you, there's always more to do than what we can ever do. Have y'all realized that about ministry? Ministry is never, like, finished. There, there's never a time when you stop and you just say, well, man, I'm glad it's all done. And that it never works like that in the church and with the things that we do. Well, today I'm also very thankful. One of our life groups has started back today and uh, very excited about that as many of our senior adults continue to be vaccinated and COVID is less and less of a factor. Uh, God has done an amazing, miraculous thing through this entire COVID epidemic in a church with 1,800 plus members. We have had no cases here on our campus that have spread. And that's just phenomenal. My parents' little church back in Mississippi, they run maybe 130, and they're split up into two services like we are. They have maybe 400 to 450 members on roll. They have had over 75 cases. And we, you know, if you include even people who are in our nursing homes, I, I've done a tally, as far as I can tell, in the membership of, of between 1,800 and 1,900, we've had 17 cases. That's, that's, that's just unheard of. And many of them were very, very, in fact, practically all of them were very light. Rod over here had it, and he said it was a head cold for him. And, and uh, so, so many others that that have had it, it was very light. So I think the hardest case was John Hall, and, um, and it's because he's had leukemia and been on, on medicine for so long, and he got it actually. He's one of our deacons. I, I see, I'm probably the only Baptist pastor that can say this in America, so I love saying it. One of our deacons caught COVID in a bar. <laughs> John Hall is a police officer and was taking down a bad guy in a bar and so he got it from the bad guy I just I just love saying that you know how many preachers get that opportunity yes our deacon caught COVID in a bar there we go but he's a good deacon I love him to death he's teaching life group right now he'll hear about that later I'm sure well uh next week I'm so excited about it it is going to be such a wonderful celebration. It's also a time of softball evangelism. When I say softball evangelism, what do I mean by that? The easiest thing you can ever do is simply invite somebody to church. It'll be a great week to invite somebody to church. We're going to have a lot of different leaders here, uh, hopefully from the community as well, as we celebrate nine, 99 years of touching the world from this place. 99 years, can't believe it. And, uh, and we also celebrate paying off a century of debt. So praise the Lord, uh, it, it's all paid off. And there's going to be, I believe, 10 major, uh, not the side dishes, 10 major food items out there that you'll be able to choose from. We actually have... Uh, the world-renowned pit master who's doing our barbecue ribs. He's won the Nash. Can you believe that? And so he's doing the ribs next week. So you can come. It's going to be all outside in the back parking lot. So we're going to have everything from ribs to smoked chicken legs. If that doesn't suit your fancy, have some chicken wings. And I, I'm fine if you don't because you can have the ham and cheese. I'll have the 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 chicken wings but anyway it's going to be a great time and like all good baptists we're going to eat till we hurt so um it'll be it'll no it'll be a wonderful wonderful celebration uh as we celebrate paying off the mortgage as well as 99 years now that leads me to the next thing you're you're not going to be able to park in back so as many people as possible next week if you're physically able would you park across the street if you're physically able and don't mind just walking across the street, uh, that would help in parking. Also, there's, there is a city parking lot. It'll hold about 20 cars, one block down from the FMC. And so there's a little parking lot uh, right across the street from the brewery. And, and it's in that, yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> hey, listen, you can buy liquor in seven places before you get to Mount Dora High School in three blocks. So it's, it's just everywhere right here. 
uh, you, you literally, we're the only church in America. You, you can walk across the street. So we, you know, but anyway, it's just the truth. Don't worry, we're not serving liquor next week. Uh, so just be aware of that parking and, and you invite somebody if you want them to see our church just have a lot of fun. You know, sometimes people need to re be reminded that church should be fun. You can come to church and have a good time. It's a wonderful thing to come to church and have a good time. I, I'm very fortunate. My kids absolutely love coming to church. They've grown up here. This is home. And they, they just want to be at church every week. And so it's an exciting thing. Well, so far this year, in this year of, of evangelism, I have preached primarily, in fact, I believe all of my sermons have been out of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I want you to know there are many evangelistic sermons throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It's the same God of the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. He's still reaching out to completely broken people reminding them all the time that he loves them and that he wants a relationship with them, whether they're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. The Lord wants the best for you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to repent of your sin and depend upon him for your salvation. That has always been since sin entered the world. And what came with sin? With sin came death and judgment. And Jesus has been reaching out, saving people this entire time, since the beginning. When you have Noah and the whole world being judged because of sin, Noah is rescued by God's grace. And not just Noah, when you have Abraham in a heathen land, God is rescuing Abraham and his family. Isaac and then Jacob. And Joseph, what a man who he rescued from his own family. His own family wanted to kill him. And then he's rescued from his family. Some of you need to be rescued from your family. <laughs> Hopefully they don't want to kill you. You know, most of you hadn't had families quite as bad as Joseph's. But then, not only is he rescued from his family, he has to be rescued from prison and from death in Egypt. And then God, by his grace, used him to save so many others. The Lord is constantly reminding us throughout the Bible that he will save you if you will simply call upon him and repent of sin. One Old Testament passage that is particularly clear is from a little book that most of you have never read. A little book in the Old Testament, and it's so clear about how to be saved. The little book is Micah. Micah. You can go ahead and try to start finding it. Micah is after Jonah and before Nahum. Does that help? Probably not. If you go to the Z books in the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, if you go back before that, in other words, you keep turning back just a few pages, you'll come to Nahum and Micah. Okay, so, so it's right there toward the end of the Old Testament. The first time I ever preached the passage that I'm going to preach to you today, I was a missionary in Hungary. I can remember it so clear. I'm on a city square, and I'm at the edge of steps, what would be like our city hall. But to the left is a whitewashed building, and they called it a... Piazza. It's, it was a big plaza there is what they called it. Just an open field like. There had been nobody preached the gospel in the town that I was preaching in since before 1941. It just breaks your heart when you hear that. No one had preached the gospel in this town since before 1941. And uh, the little town did have a Baptist church. The members that were still alive were all ancient, and there was uh, between 8 and 12 of them. That was it. That was all that was left. And I preached this little passage for the very first time. Over 1,200 people showed up in this square. 
200 people received Jesus Christ that night after watching the Jesus film on the side of that building and then I preached these words that I'm going to preach to you today. It was such an incredible experience and I don't know what I preached other than the text. I, when I was serving over there, I rarely could keep notes. I tried to keep journals of where I would be because I might be in four villages in a day. And so uh, as I traveled and preached the gospel all over. Micah, this little bitty book, is only seven chapters, but it gives such a clear picture of who God is. Have you ever heard it said, hate the sin but love the sinner? You ever heard that said before? That is the little book of Micah. God hates sin. Y'all, just st stop and ask yourself this question. Will sin be in heaven? No. There's no sin in heaven. Now, doesn't that just in your mind immediately produce a quandary because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? It almost begins to make you think, how are we going to get there? There's no sin in heaven. Well, it's because God does this radical work in us by faith, through grace, when he saves us in Jesus' name, by the blood of the Lamb. He does this amazing work, and he doesn't just pardon our sin. He literally justifies us so that we have his nature and become as he is. In other words, God makes us holy by giving his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. Many of you may have never heard much about the Spirit of God. It's not this ambiguous thing. The Spirit of God is literally the Spirit, Jesus' very own Spirit, that always honors and glorifies Jesus Christ and is always in compliance with the Word of God. So if you ever feel an inclination that goes against anything in Scripture, it is not God's Holy Spirit. Okay, the Spirit of God is always in line with the Word of God. Always. And so Micah, in this little book, does an amazing thing as he reminds the people that God is going to judge all sin. And sin cannot be in the presence of God. But at the same time, he's reaching out and saying, but God loves you. He died for you. He's, he loves you. He wants you by faith to trust in him. Now, when is Micah preaching? Micah is at the same time as many of God's greats. He's during the reign of both Hezekiah and a wicked little toad of a king who had a gorgeous, ungodly wife. She was absolutely beautiful on the outside, and on the inside, she was mean as a snake. His name, and you can almost just talk nasally when you think of him, his name was King Ahaz. Ahaz, wicked little man. The only recorded instance in the entire Bible where a wife signed the king's name. She signed it. She got done whatever she wanted to do because she was willing to sign his name on whatever needed to be done, she thought. Wicked, wicked woman. So you have Jezebel and Ahaz. You have the godly king, Hezekiah. You have the great prophet, Elijah. Y'all remember Elijah who confronted Ahaz. But you also have, during the same time, Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, all of these are preaching at the same time as Micah. Now, I like Micah because he's a country boy. He's not a city boy. He's about 20 miles southeast of Jerusalem. So he's a country boy growing up in the country and just kind of tells it like it is. But what else is going on during the time of Micah? Well, in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom, Israel, falls. It falls to the Assyrians. The Assyrians are such wicked people, they're the ones who first developed crucifixion, by the way. Now, the Romans perfected it, but they, they got it from the Assyrians. The Assyrians started it all. So in 722, the ten tribes to the north are destroyed, and here's what the Assyrians do. Because the Jewish people have had all these idols 
and everything, they thought, well, the best way to deal with them is to disperse them, send them away. And the Assyrians literally sent the ten tribes, there's some of them that they sent as far away as northern India and present-day Afghanistan. So it makes you wonder, when Jewish blood ends up in somebody who's from India, and you think, how'd that happen? Well, it goes all the way back to when the Assyrians were shipping them all out. They just shipped them out. You cause us trouble, that's fine, we'll move you away. Never to be seen again. And in their place, they moved in other people into the land of Israel in the northern kingdom. Now, in 701 B.C., the Assyrians move into the southern kingdom. Hezekiah is now the king. And they literally take the whole land and destroy it except for Jerusalem. They do not take Jerusalem. Sennacherib's the general. And it ends up that the king of Assyria later on is killed in his own house by his sons because if I'm not mistaken, it was well over 100,000 soldiers died outside the city gates of Jerusalem. God sent a plague one night and rescued the city. But the Assyrians couldn't stand a loss. So their own literature records this and the death of their king who was stabbed by his children. Boy, don't you, aren't you glad you don't have kids quite that bad yet? If your kids are stabbing you, you know there's problems, okay? So uh, that's what uh, a little bit of the background. All that's going on in Micah. Now, Micah lived in a time where religion really didn't make much difference. Now, I want you to understand how this relates to us today. They would have their big festivals, Passover, and the Feast of Weeks, and those kinds of things. And everybody who was anybody would show up in Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice, and at least twice a year they were coming, just like Christmas and Easter. And everybody would show up. But the other six days a week, live like you want, cuss however you want to cuss, as long as it's not in front of somebody that might not approve, do whatever you want to do, because religion didn't make much difference in their life. Sounds very much like America, very much like America, where you can just do whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say, think whatever you want to think, Believe whatever you want to believe, and you'll just go for a few religious services through the year to make yourself feel better. That's the culture that Micah is in. So it speaks to our hearts today and, and our culture today. I love Micah's name. It actually means who is like the Lord. In other words, can the Lord make a difference? Who is like the Lord? There is no one like the Lord. And I want you to know the Lord Jesus can still make a difference in your life today. You can leave here different than when you came in. Today, your life can be different. Micah is so important. If you found the little book, you can turn to five, chapter 5, verse 2. And when Herod the Great, in 4 B.C., wants to know where will the Christ child be born? Where will the Messiah be born? Well, he called all the scholars together, and in 700 B.C., Micah had written verse 2 of chapter 5. There weren't any numbers in it, but it was very clear what that said. And Bethlehem is where Messiah would be born. What an incredible little book this is, as he's literally fulfilling Scripture and prophesying about things that will happen more than 700 years later. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So Herod the Great, when he was read that scripture, made sure in his mind that the Christ child would be killed, Messiah would be ended, and he killed all the babies in Bethlehem and the surrounding community. And it was all in an effort to stop Jesus. Well, you know that Joseph and Mary had fled to Egypt, and that didn't happen, and 
baby Jesus was just fine. And so even that fulfilled scripture. Well, when it comes to being true and accurate, you will never find a more accurate and true book than the Bible. God's word is true and accurate and more than 700 years. Y'all, it's hard to wrap your mind around 700 years. Think back to George Washington and how many of you knew him. Our first president, go to George Washington. Y'all know that's been quite a long time ago. Then double that time and then triple that time and that's how long it had been since Michael wrote those words. Triple the time since... George Washington was president. That is some incredible prophecy. That's pretty accurate, folks. So when the Bible says, Jesus is coming again, and I take that time from George Washington, and I double it, and I triple it, and I quadruple it, and then I do that again, and I want you to know, every day is closer because the book doesn't lie. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again, folks. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready to see Jesus? He's coming. Well, let's all stand in honor of God's Word, and I'll be in Micah chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Micah 6, and I'm only going to read three verses, three little verses, beginning in Micah 6, verse 6. Hear the Word of the Lord. And what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? What shall I come before him, or shall I come before him with burnt, with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? In other words, you're thinking about what would I give for my salvation? What, what, what kind of atonement can I make? And then he says, even ask this, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then verse 8, if you don't have this underlined in your copy of God's Word, you need to underline it. It's a great verse. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. May God's word not come back void. You may be seated. People have tried all kinds of ways to please God, but the Lord has made his thoughts very clear. You can never buy your salvation. When it's talking about rams and rivers of oil, you need to think through. They're trying to put a value dollar on your salvation. What would you pay? So they list astronomical amounts. Thousands of rams? Well, no person could give that. And then he says this, 10,000 rivers of oil? Now listen, whether you're talking about 10,000 rivers of crude from Texas or Saudi Arabia, or whether you're talking about 10,000 rivers of olive oil, any way you cut it, that's a lot of moolah. That's a lot of money. And he's saying no amount of money, no matter how much it is, can pay for your salvation. No amount is big enough for your transgressions. And then he uses hyperbole and he throws out something that's really crazy. Should I give my firstborn for my salvation? Well, we all know that child sacrifice in the Bible is explicitly forbidden in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It's listed in there because all the nations around Israel did child sacrifice and God was was telling them you can't be like that I know y'all have heard the the it, well I say you've heard of it you probably have because if I've been your pastor for longer than 10 years I know you've heard it uh, there's two gods listed throughout the Old Testament that aren't real gods at all they're idols one is Molech and the other is pronounced two different ways Baal or Baal B-A-A-L neither are gods they're idols in both forms of worship, there was child sacrifice with all the nations surrounding Israel. But Molech specifically required it. And Molech, the idol, had swinging arms. The arms would swing. And on his lap, he was seated, on his lap was the altar of fire. And when they worshipped Molech, they would put their babies 
in the arms of the idol and it would swing down and drop their babies into the fire. That's what they did in child sacrifice. So Mo, what Micah is saying here is nothing can pay for your salvation. It's the idea of atonement. What is big enough to atone for my personal sin? Just think about this for a minute. Is there any sin in heaven? No, class. There's no sin in heaven. Never will there be sin in heaven. That's why you have to be saved. And the scripture says, God saves you to the uttermost so that there's nothing in you when he saves you that is evil that goes to heaven. Nothing in you that is bad that goes to heaven. Nothing in you that in any way has a wrong motive that goes to heaven. When God saves you, he saves you to the uttermost. He makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. He gives you a new identity. He gives you a new name. You are covered by the blood of the Lamb. You are made righteous and holy in God's sight so that there is nothing that shall separate you from the love of God. Neither height nor depth, nothing. Nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God who is in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful thing. He makes you that new, that different. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to realize what God has done for us. There's few things that the Lord really desires. Very few. Micah takes all the laws of the Old Testament and he boils it down to three simple commands. Three simple commands. To do, to love, to walk. Three simple things, to do, to love, to walk. Micah boils it all down, all the Old Testament laws, and says that you're to do justly, you're to love mercy, and you're to walk humbly with your God. You know, conduct really does matter. How you live really does matter. You are to be faithful in all of your ways, in all of your ways. It doesn't matter about the innumerable sacrifices. It doesn't matter about how much money you give. It's supposed to be a commitment to faithful living, and you do those things because you love God, not to earn your salvation. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16 is very clear. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. In other words, if you're not holy, you will not see Jesus. I'll give you a quick example that's at the end of my sermon right now. I knew a man who was a church member, had been baptized, and told me, uh, just ball-faced, I can swing over hell on a corn stalk and I'm not afraid. I thought, ooh, I actually told him, I said, I'm not that brave. Do not test the Lord your God. That was the thought I had. He was the most bitter, angry person I've ever known. Before his death, he was estranged from his children. He had been married three times, and there was nothing in his life that said he was born again. Nothing whatsoever. Yet, like I said, he had been baptized, was a church member, those kinds of things. God expects our conduct to matter. Our words, he would cuss over and over and over again, sometimes just to see if he could get a reaction out of me. You know, you, have y'all ever known people like that? that just, they're going to do it for shock value just to see if they can. I've been related to a lot of those people. So uh, they do things for shock value, and that's how he operated. Yet God says conduct really does matter. These first two verses, verse 7 and 8, show us the need for atonement, an awareness of sin. In other words, what will someone do to take my place? I, I can't do it with a, a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil. What will I pay for my salvation? Is there anything that can be done? 
And then in verse 8, you have the answer. What does the Lord require of you? Isn't that a great question? You ever wondered, what does the Lord require of me? You know what the question really is? In common lingo, when it says, what does the Lord require of me? Common lingo is like this. What do I need to do to be saved? That's what he's really saying. What do I need to do to be saved? What does the Lord require of me? So many people want to know, and here it is, to do justly. That's the first part. Obviously, that involves our actions, our doing. Our, our doing. It involves our words, what we do and what we say. We must treat others fairly. Well, that, that goes without saying, to treat others fairly. But it goes to something that I, you've heard me say many times. Do the right thing. Do what you say you will do. Just do the right thing to do justly. It means we don't lie about things. It means we don't steal from anyone because that would not be just. It's how we treat others. This was the case of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, uh, I mentioned him last week. I was talking about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, and the rich young ruler is in Luke 18. And he says that he's done justly. He actually, to quote him in verse 21, says this, All these things I have kept from my youth. Well, what was it that Jesus had said to him? Jesus had said to him to do justly. Jesus gave him five commands in verse 20. Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. By the way, false witness, that's an old term. What does that mean, class? Lie. Do not lie. That's what it really means when it says don't bear false witness, not to lie. And then honor your father and mother. These are things that you do and don't do. In other words, you're to do justly. And the rich young ruler was doing justly, but he was not saved. He was not saved. Did, you know what that means? You can be a good person and be lost. You can be a, a, a church member and be lost. You can be baptized and you can be lost. There are many good people who do justly and they are lost people. So today, you may be a good person, you may help people, you may act justly, but you can still be lost. Firefighters are the best example I can think of. Firefighters are good people. They rescue people all day long. That's their job, is to rescue people. They have compassion on people. They help people. But just because you're a firefighter does not mean you're born again. You understand if that was the case, everybody could just be firefighters and be saved. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Me trying to be a firefighter, that's just funny. <laughs> so in some ways, I'm a spiritual firefighter. I'm trying to dampen the fires of hell and keeping you from going there. But that's as close as I get, Eric, right there, you know. Uh, and so just because you're a firefighter doesn't make you saved. Just because you're a church member, it doesn't make you saved. To do justly is not enough. It's the beginning point. Secondly, what does the Lord require of you? What does it take to be saved? Look at the text. To love mercy. To love mercy. Mercy is a hard word for us today. Nobody in regular conversation says, oh, uh, I just love mercy. You know, mer we may say a person is merciful, but that's about as far as we go with it. And usually when we say merciful, here's what we mean. We mean compassionate. That's what we mean. When we say someone's merciful, we think compassionate. That is not the Hebrew definition of mercy. Compassion does not equal mercy. They're different words in Hebrew. And so we have a misunderstanding of what this is today. The idea in Hebrew includes loyalty and faithfulness. To love faithfulness. To love loyalty. In other words, faithfulness to God's promises. It's the idea of love in continual action like a snowball going down a mountain that never stops. It is love in continual action. That is loving mercy. But it's very hard for us to wrap our minds around that. So uh, here's how I would take it. 
to move it to our current vernacular and get the thought. You love with what? Your heart. That's what we would say. We, we love with our heart. And when you love with your heart, you have to think, who is mercy? Well, God is merciful. The Lord is continuing in his mercy. The Lord is merciful. So we love God with our whole heart is the ultimate root that we have to get to. To love God and then to love others. This really embodies the greatest commandment that Jesus quotes to the Pharisees from Deuteronomy. That we should love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And the second is like it, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Mercy includes that idea of loyalty and faithfulness to God's promises. But just to be sure, so that no one can misunderstand, so that there's no mistake, what does the Lord require of you to do? to love, and those are possible perhaps for, certainly for a moment, maybe even for a year, but so that there's no misunderstanding, what does the Lord require of you to walk humbly with your God? Oh, that takes it where it's not just a moment, where it's not just a year, but you're looking at this over the totality of your life. Walking implies a trust in now what is the trust in for the hebrew mindset what is the trust in it is a trust in the blood that was shed in the sacrifice for atonement that is the hebrew mindset what is the trust in i have sacrificed the goat or the lamb or the pigeon or the dove or the calf i have sacrificed this and I trust in the blood that was shed for my atonement. Ah, take it to where you are now, right where you sit. Do you trust in the sacrifice that was made for you? Do you trust in the sacrifice that was made on Calvary for you? Do you trust in Jesus taking your place on the cross? Do you trust in Jesus paying your sin debt on the cross? Do you trust in what Jesus has done in being your substitute on the cross? See, walking humbly is a continual action that we do daily. To walk with the Lord, it means we remain faithful to the Lord's commands. It means we do what He says. It means when He says give, you give. When he says pray, you pray. When he says go, you go. When he says love, you love. When he says forgive, you forgive. When he says serve, you serve. And he says to walk humbly. We recognize who we are, and we recognize who he is. He is God, and you know what that means? You are not. You're not God. None of us are. It means that we walk humbly, recognizing that we're sinners and he's the Savior. We walk with the Lord faithfully. We walk with the Lord daily. We walk in continual action with the Lord, asking for forgiveness day by day, and that the Lord would protect us from the things of this world that cause us to stumble. Walking with the Lord means that we put up safeguards in our life. You say, what are, what are you talking about, to put up safeguards in your life? It means that you do things automatically to protect your children, your work, your future, your wife. You put up all of those things to protect yourself because you want to walk with the Lord. Walking with the Lord means depending on Him day by day. You've heard Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. In all your ways, that means you don't pray when you're on the date. It means you pray before you go on a date and say, Lord, do I need to date this person? When I was dating, I had God tell me no specifically a number of times. Don't even go out with them. Don't even do that. Listen, it's worth the wait when she's the right one. It's always worth the wait to wait upon the Lord. It means you ask the Lord about what college to go to. If you're of that age, what college do I go to, Lord? What major do I have? 
What classes should I take this semester? Walking with the Lord means depending and trusting upon Him. Do I have this person in business? And for some of you who own businesses, it even means, do I take this person on as a client? Guess what? You do not want every client. In any business, you don't want every customer or client. Just ask Rod. <laughs> you don't. You don't want everybody. You have to pray and say, Lord, protect me from clients that won't pay. Protect me from clients that will just be difficult and make my life miserable. We have to pray in all of our ways as we walk humbly with the Lord. So if you want to please God, what areas do you need to examine in your own life? Are you fair in dealing with other people? Do you show mercy to those who wrong you? That's a big one. To love mercy. Let me help you here. Everybody in this room, you will be sinned against. You will be wrong. Go ahead and raise your hand. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to do you wrong. Most likely, it will be a relative. You're going to have relatives do you wrong. I hate to say that, but if you've got any blood kin, I'm just telling you, at some point, how do I know that? Because everybody that's married in the room, there's no two perfect people. Even in marriage, even in marriage, you're going to be wronged. Somebody, you know, somebody's going to say something they shouldn't say. It's going to hurt your feelings. You're going to be upset about it. Something's going to happen, and it's going to just push your button. That happens in all great marriages. It happens in all great marriages. Where sometimes... Things don't go right. Things, that, you know, my wife's told me at times, you just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You need to go back to bed. <laughs> I, I mean, it happens in life. You're going to have people sin against you, even people you love. And to love mercy means that you forgive. You forgive and you let it go and you move forward. Whether it was a relative or a friend, or a neighbor, or a co-worker, or whoever it was. The greatest places in life will probably be where you hurt the most. What are the greatest places in life? Well, I always think, number one, family. Family is one of the greatest places in life, but your family can also be very painful, okay? So it's going to happen in family. One of the greatest places in life is at church. I absolutely love church. I love worshiping Jesus. But you're going to have your feelings hurt at church. Somebody's not going to like the way you dress or what you say at some point in time. Somebody told me this week of an illustration that a pastor made, and they will never go back to the church because he used an illustration. And, and, and so we have to be careful all the time because everybody's not where you are. You know, it, it's just one of those things. I, I, I've had people in Sunday school classes say, I'll never go back to that life group class again. And I'll say, why? Well, this one, and they'll just start saying, the person didn't say anything wrong, they just said too much. That's the, the bottom line, that's what would happen. Didn't say anything wrong, they just said too much. We've got to be forgiving, folks. To walk humbly with the Lord means let it go. Life is too short to major on the minors. It's just too short. And life is not worth letting someone else make you bitter. They're not worth it. Let it go and move forward. To love mercy means that you forgive others as the Lord has forgiven you. How much has the Lord forgiven you? Everything. Then you forgive others. You forgive others. The Bible says that those who would live in fellowship with a holy God must live in a way that's holy. And that means we're forgiving. So, are you living differently? How should you live differently when you're saved? That's what Micah's really saying. Once you're saved, what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. The truth is that judgment usually only comes after many opportunities to repent. Many opportunities. God doesn't typically judge us the first time we mess up, but after many opportunities, yes. 
But even in the midst of judgment, if people will act, love, and walk with God, then he will forgive and bring them through judgment. Yes, the Lord God punishes sin. That's why there's hell. You ever wonder why there's hell? Because God's going to punish sin. Ultimately, Satan and all of his demons will be there. By the way, they are not there now. I've heard many people say, Satan is in hell. Not yet. Not yet. He's roaming this earth, seeking whom he may devour. So he's not there yet, folks. Ultimate judgment hasn't happened yet. But the Lord wants to rescue all people. Everyone who repents and believes in Jesus will have eternal life and dwell with him forever and ever. Micah ends with such beautiful words. In chapter 7, verse 18, it says this, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. I say that like a real southerner. Do y'all, y'all, if you read it, you'll understand what I'm saying. Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. This is the Lord God. He will again have compassion on us. Oh, I love how it ends in verse 19. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. What beautiful words that the Lord wants in every way to forgive you and to cleanse you and cast your sins into the depths of the, tr- of the sea. Our Lord is truly different than all the other gods that people have on earth. He, do- he not only judges sin, he'll pardon us and he'll justify us so that it is as if the sin has never happened. He completely cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He washes us. He makes us white as snow on the inside of our hearts. He creates clean hearts. He will not only forgive sin, but he will defeat it, and he puts it away from us. He casts our sins into the depths of the sea. Has the Lord done that for you? Have you been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you asked the Lord to create in you a clean heart? Are you sure if you died today, you would go to heaven? There's only one way to go to heaven, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in Him. Today is the day of salvation. Trust in Jesus today. You will never regret it. I'll be down in front in just a moment. Or you can go to the Welcome Center if you want to social distance. Others of you in this very room, you need to follow through with believer's baptism. You're holding out on Jesus. You don't want to humble yourself. Listen, to follow the Lord Jesus takes humility. We have to humble ourselves. Today, say yes to Jesus. If you say no to Jesus today, I want you to know it'll be easier the next time. And you'll go through your life saying no to Jesus. Walk humbly with the Lord. Others of you here need to join this church. You may have even gone through the discovery class, but you haven't either come forward or gone to the Welcome Center to let anyone know that you want to be a part of this family. Today, jump in. Say, yes, it's time for me to belong to a church family. It so will help you grow. Let's all stand. Lord, we pray in this moment that you would help all of us Lord, every one of us in the room need to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Lord, help us to follow what you require. What does the Lord require from us to do, to love, to walk? Lord, you help us. And in this moment, if there's anyone here who needs you as their Savior, I pray that they would make that known by either going to the Welcome Center or coming to see me. For others, Lord, who need to follow through with believers' baptism and church membership, you help them, Father, to step out by faith and to walk humbly with with you, Lord. So you bless us even now as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as I am. so proud of
So thank you, uh, and so I, I look so forward. Uh, Rush will be baptized in days uh, to come, the young woman that you just saw come forward, and the Lord's been working in our heart in an incredible way, and so what a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, remember, next week we're going to celebrate. We're having a celebration. I mean, it won't be Disney, but the food will be better and much less expensive, Okay. <laughs> So much less expensive than Disney. So you come ready to celebrate. Our former pastor, who's a dear friend of mine, Brother Bob Walker, will also be here. We're the only two living pastors uh, that have pastored First Mount Dora, and so he'll be with us. And we're just going to have a grand celebration all day. It's going to be so beautiful. Feel free to invite a friend. We're going to have plenty of food, folks. We're cooking and cooking, and co it's going to be plenty. And so the way it'll work is you're not getting big plates. Everybody's going to get a little tray. You can just go around. And I like that because then you can sample a little bit of everything. I want a chicken leg. I want a wing. Give me a rib or two. You know, just I'll even end up with a ham and cheese. It's one of those things. So we're just going to enjoy all day. And you'll love this. The greatest part for you, you're not paying for anything. We're not, we're not doing that. Y'all paid enough. We paid over $3 million on the building. In total, it was over $4 million. And, and so uh, it's all paid, and so you're not paying for dinner. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Well, let's close with the benediction. I, it, remember, Wednesday nights are grand. I would encourage you, if you've not been in choir, come this Wednesday night. We're going to have a marvelous time in here this coming Wednesday night. If you can sing, if you can't sing, come, come be with me. <laughs> Come, come, come be with the Bible study. There's a men's Bible study. I'm doing a Bible study. There, there's all kinds of stuff. And the youth, the Lord's been blessing. We've been having between 45 and 55 youth every Wednesday night. The Lord's been, I don't know if you noticed on the video, 
of doing the meals, but there were uh, almost 20 young people helping to prepare all those meals last week in the gym. So just marvelous that they're learning to serve. And there was a ton of youth yesterday at the Walk for Life. I mean, like, of over 40 members, I believe uh, three, four, there, there was probably 15 of our young people at the Walk for Life yesterday. So a uh, beautiful thing. Well, let's close with a prayer. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be all glory and power, majesty and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Be blessed, and I look forward to welcoming you home this next week. When the best of me is barely breathing when I'm not somebody I believe in hold on to me when I miss the light the night is stolen when I'm slamming all the doors you've opened hold on to me Hold on to me Hold on to me when it's too dark to see you When I am sure I have reached the end Hold on to me when I forget I need you When I let go hold me Again. When I don't feel like I'm worth defending, when I'm tired of my pretending, hold on to me. When I stop to break in desperation, underneath the weight of Hold on to me Hold on to me Hold on to me when it's too dark to see you When I am sure I have reached the end Hold on to me Cause I know nobody loves me better Hold on to me Hold on to me